How many of you, I have to, I have to see, how many of you are undecorated from Christmas? All done? I won't make you put your hand up if you still have your tree up. I don't. I'm done. I'm done. You know, that's one of the most awful jobs in the whole world, isn't it? <laughs> Taking down your Christmas decorations. Last Monday, we had a snow day. So it's like the morning and Gwen and I look at each other and we're like, now is the time. The dreaded time where we have to take advantage of this and take down all of our Christmas decorations. By the way, wasn't, wasn't Gwen glowing this morning? <laughs> yes, we are expecting our third child in July. How about that? <laughs> we can avoid all the awkwardness like, she kind of looks, should I say? Yes, it's true. Okay, it's all true. It's all true. Well, anyway, it's a great feeling that the decorating from Christmas was done, that we took it down, it's all over. Because my fellow parents know something very important. Christmas break is like a war when you have multiple kids. It's like you just made it through a war. You know, the kids are at home all the time. They're always overstimulated. It's a total free-for-all. There's new toys to fight over. It's crazy. Our girls usually get along. You know, they're great to each other usually, but you know, throw in a few presents that the other one wants and it can get really, really interesting. So I wish I would have kept track of how many times we said, tell your sister you're sorry. Tell your sister you're sorry. You hit her, tell her you're sorry over and over again. And after all of those apologies, I realized something. Why do we even bother telling kids to say that they're sorry? Do they ever really mean it? Like, like, why bother? There's no way that they mean it. Like, my three-year-old, Taya, yeah, tell her you're sorry, Taya. Yeah, she's really sorry that she smacked Millie. Because you know what? In a few minutes, I know that she's just going to do it again and again and again. She's not sorry. She's just hoping that she says sorry, and then Millie will actually give her what she wants. There's no real Sorry. And what do we as parents expect? You know, Taya's going to sit and repent in dust and ashes for the crime that she's committed? She's not sorry. Kids aren't sorry. They're never sorry. Sorry is just an obstacle that we put in their path just to say. Are they ever really sorry? They're not sorry. You know, I wonder, though, if the same thing can be said about us adults sometimes, too, though right? Are we ever really sorry? <clears throat> this is the first message in a series called The Life of a King, and it's all about David. So over the next many weeks, probably even into the summer, I don't know, we're going to be looking at the life of one of the Bible's most famous characters, King David, a man after God's own heart. But before we get to David, I thought it was important to spend just one message on a man named Saul. Now, I told Gwen this. I said, you know, I think I have to start with a message about Saul. And she was like, that's a real downer for the new year. Are you sure you want to start the series with Saul? And uh, so if the message isn't very good today, I guess Gwen was right, and I guess I shouldn't have. But I think it's just really important to understand Saul before we get to David, because David comes on the scene when Saul is king. And if you know anything about David, you know that Saul is a huge part of David's life, especially in the early years. So before we get to our main text today, which is from 1 Samuel chapter 15, I want to just quickly back up and look at some context about what's going on in this time. The story of Saul and even David actually kind of start in 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel 8 verse 19, it says this, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said no. But there shall be a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. 
So the people wanted a king so that they would be like all the nations. And so Saul becomes their king. Now, think about this. Isn't it amazing how things birthed out of wrong motives never turn out the way that we envision? Right? Things birthed out of wrong motives, they never turn out. The people were essentially replacing God as their king and as their warrior in favor of an earthly one, like all the other nations. We want to be like all the other nations. That is wrong motives. And listen, every time we replace God in favor of earthly pursuits and acceptance, does it ever really turn out for us? It never turns out. As a matter of fact, think about it. The very things that we replace God with are the very things that then hold us back from experiencing all that God wants us to experience from him. When we replace God with those other things, those are the things that actually hold us back. We think we're gonna move forward by replacing those things, but it really just holds us back. 1 Samuel 9, 17, it says this, When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who will, look at that, restrain my people. And this word here for restrain is usually always used in a negative context. It means to shut up, to imprison, to close, to detain. So listen, when God is replaced, we are restrained. When God is replaced in our lives, we are restrained. Here's the reality, right? You don't need another king to sit on the throne of your life. That position belongs to the king of kings. You don't need to go to other things that claim to fight your battles for you. God said, I will fight your battles for you. He is our warrior and he is our king. But when we replace him, We are restrained. We don't need acceptance in the eyes of the world. We're already accepted as a child of God. And yet the people asked for a king to rule over them. And so it was Saul who became their king. When God is replaced, we are restrained. Quick side note. You know what the name Saul means? It actually means asked for. So as we will continue throughout this narrative, in Saul, the people got exactly what they asked for. (laughs) It's literally his name. They got what they asked for, and you'll see that more and more. Hey, you know what it's like to get exactly what you ask for sometimes now, don't you? Uh Uh-huh. You're going to get what you ask for, don't you worry. Now let's get to the passage for today. 1 Samuel chapter 15. So this is Saul. This is why he's there in the first place, okay? 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So what commandment has Saul performed? Well, earlier in the chapter, this is what God commanded, okay? This is from verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go, and this is the command, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them. Kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now, Wilson actually referenced this verse last week, if you remember, And it can be a really hard and confusing verse to read, right? And really, the rest of the sermon could be all about why. Why is God commanding this? What what is going on here? Well, before we move on, I thought it at least demanded some type of understanding of what is happening here. And I found this really great summary, and I just wanted to read it to you. We wonder about God commanding the Israelites to totally destroy the enemy, including all the women and children. How can that possibly be right? If we were presenting a message on just these few verses, then we would take some time to talk about God as the giver and taker of life 
and God's righteous judgment on sin. And how these were rare instances in the Old Testament where God brought his final judgment of sin forward into the present time as signs and warnings of the judgment to come. Suffice it to say, God is always just in his actions, that this was a unique time in Old Testament history that God chose to bring his just judgment for sin upon the Amalekites at this time, and he was using the nation of Israel to do it. Man, that could be a sermon series about these things, but I thought that was a great summary just to understand. So this is what the Lord commanded. Go and strike Amalek, devote to destruction all that they have, do not spare them, but kill both the man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That's what God commanded. Now, back to the story. When Samuel comes to Saul in verse 13, Saul's saying, I performed the commandment of the Lord, buddy. I've done it. I've done what he said. Look at me. I'm, I'm doing it. But there's a problem with him saying that. Look at verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Saul didn't perform the commandment of the Lord. God said, destroy everything. Destroy everything. Yet Saul spared Agag and kept all that was good. God said, there's nothing good. Saul said, I'm going to keep what's good. So now let's see what happens when Samuel approaches him about this. So he comes to Saul. Saul said, you know, I performed all the commandments. Look at verse 14. And Samuel said, this is like the best. What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Let's just understand. Saul is pronouncing his performance of executing the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel goes, dude. I can hear the sheep that you were supposed to kill behind you. What are you saying? I mean, how foolish. Saul must have looked saying, I've performed the commandment of the Lord when the sheep and oxen could be heard clearly behind him. Oh, and how foolish we look when we claim rightness but the sheep and oxen can be heard clearly behind us. This is what Jesus said in Luke 12, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. You know something? Sheep, Make noise. (laughs) Sheep make noise. And we all know what it's like to have sheep, right? We disobey the Lord. We kind of, you know, look, there's signs of us not obeying the Lord around us. We all carry these things. We all disobey. We all fall short. We all fall to live up to what God has commanded. So listen, either you can confess it or you can try to cover it. But if you try to cover it, sheep make noise. You can hear the sheep behind you. Oh, everything's good here. It's all good here. We can hear the sheep. It's not good. You're not fooling anybody. We can hear it. And if we can hear it, God can hear it too. Right? So either you can just confess it or you can try to cover it. But covering it doesn't work. So then look at this guy next. Look what he does next. Verse 15. Look at this. Saul said, oh, okay, now I'm caught. But they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. You know, isn't this classic? The woman made me do it. The woman made me eat of the fruit. Now the people made me do it. The people made me do it. Yeah. I saw this quote the other day from... Um, Famous basketball coach, John Wooden. Um, He said, blame is the key indicator of failure. 
Blame is the key indicator of failure. The people made me do it. Now, you know what's interesting about this? Let's look back at verse 9, okay? Remember this? But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep. You do a little word study there, you find that the word spared is what's known as a singular verb. So that means that this whole sparing thing was spearheaded by a single person. Can you guess who that was? (laughs) It was Saul. The people might have gone along with it, but it was Saul's idea to spare this guy, okay? It was his idea. Now, why would he want to do this? Why would he spare this king? Well, here you go. Back in those days, having an enemy king in your prison signified strength. So what Saul wanted to do, he wanted to keep Agag alive as a sign of the power of his own kingdom, to increase his own standing in the eyes of the world. Look, I have Agag. I'm a great king. That's why he kept him alive. So you ready for this one? I read this and I was like, oh, this one will preach. You ready for this? (laughs) What are you keeping alive in your life that God said to kill just so you can further your own kingdom and your own status. We do it too. We keep things alive in our lives that God said, kill it, kill it. But here's the bottom line. We don't always kill our pride, do we? We live in it. We don't always kill our selfish pursuits, do we? We pursue them anyway. We don't always kill our desire and our endless pursuit to be accepted by others. We just try harder to be accepted. We don't always kill our greed because deep down, we want an increase of our own kingdom. We want an increase of our own status. So I want you to think about that. Write it down. Think about it. God, what have you told me to kill? that I'm keeping alive. Look at Romans chapter eight. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you, what? Put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What is God calling you to kill in your life. If you want to be more PG about it, what is he calling you to end? Things in our lives need to end, to be killed. What are those things in your life? Let's keep going. Verse 16. I love this. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. (laughs) That's a good word for somebody today too, right? Just stop. Stop. Just stop it. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, look, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go to vote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. He's just spelling it out for him. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Here he goes again. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. This guy's delusional. (laughs) I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people, here we go again, took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So Samuel just, he lays it all out in front of Saul. And look how Saul responds. Saul said to Samuel, verse 24, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, 
because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Oh, he gets it. Yeah, but then there's a verse 25. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. Now, at first reading, you might think, oh, he got it. Saul is saying he's sorry. He's seen the light and he's repenting. He's seen his shortcomings, he's seen his wrongdoings, and he's doing the right thing now. Well, in verse 24, it looks as if Saul's saying he's sorry. Uh, but then there's a verse 25. <laughs> there shouldn't be a verse 25. Verse 24 is sorry, and verse 25 is not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Listen to this quote. The confession, Saul's confession, was not so much the result of inward conviction as it was evidence of Saul's, losing fe Saul's fear of losing the acclaim of the people. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Look at verse 25. Here's what's important. Look, it says, return with me. Saul is asking Samuel, return with me that I may bow before the Lord. Now, if Samuel wouldn't have returned with Saul, it would have been a major loss of face for Saul. Samuel gave him validation in the eyes of the people. So Saul really just wanted to make sure, Samuel, you're coming back with me, right? Okay, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but, um, but you're going to still come with me, right? You, but you still, so you're going to come with me now? This wasn't repentance. It wasn't. He's not truly repentant. He's just trying to escape the consequences of his sin and save face. Look at verse 26. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And that's where we arrive at David. And if you know anything about David, you're going to know a lot more about David in the weeks to come. But if you know anything about him, you know that he wasn't perfect either. He made some pretty big mistakes. He disobeyed too. But look at the heart of David in Psalm 51. Compare that to what you just heard from Saul. Listen to this heart. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Not the people made me do it. Against you only have I sinned so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now that is a repentant heart. That's a repentant heart. That's not sorry, not sorry. That, oh God, I am sorry. Create in me a clean heart. He didn't care about preserving his kingdom or what other people thought about him. He just said sorry. And that is what made David a man after God's own heart. Not that he always got it right, but because he said Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. He saw his sin and he understood his shortcomings and he repented of it. But before we get into David, there'll be a lot more David. Let's get back to Saul. As we conclude this morning, I just, I just want to end with this one simple question. What made Saul a sorry, not sorry person? 
Why did he feel that he always had to do this and explain things? Because let's be honest, right? We all have a tendency to go down the same path and have the same attitude. Have you ever been a sorry, not sorry person? (laughs) I know I have. There's been plenty of times where I avoid repentance to save my own reputation and my own kingdom. Sorry, not sorry. In the life of Saul, here's why this is important to understand. If you see the life of Saul, this right here was the turning point for him. After this, his life becomes an endless tailspin of self-destruction. He, he gets criticized and that sends him into a violent rage, as we'll see. And this is the King Saul that David will meet. So I think the question, well, what made Saul a sorry, not sorry person is a really important question for us to ask because we can just go down the same sorry, not sorry Saul path of bitterness. It's a bad path to go down. So I really pondered this question and this is where God led me, listen. Saul was a sorry, not sorry person because he wasn't free. He wasn't free. He was held captive to the approval of others. He was held captive to protecting his own reputation. He he was a slave endlessly trying to build his own kingdom. He was a prisoner to his own self. Saul wasn't free. And listen, here's the lesson for us today. The path to freedom starts with repentance. The path to freedom starts with repentance. If you wanna be free, repent. When Saul is confronted by all these things by Samuel, you know, Samuel laid it all out for him. He could have been freed by his own prison and his own self-destruction by just saying, you're right. Amen. I'm sorry. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I'm not exactly sure why, but I think a lot of times repentance in our minds is used, is, is like a negative word. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I think we fall into the trap of associating repentance with negative things. Listen, that's not true. It's, it, it can be a negative thing if we're only concerned with our own kingdoms, but repentance isn't a negative thing. It's something to be embraced. It's a gift. It's a gift where you can just lay it all down and be free from it. Repentance is a gift from Jesus himself. Jesus freed you to repentance. He frees you to repentance. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The last time I checked, that's a good thing. (laughs) He's going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Just confess your sins. Lay it down. Look at David in, in Psalm 32. Here he is again. Listen, when I refuse to confess my sin, I know you've been here. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away. And I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. And look, finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And what? You forgave me. All my guilt is gone. (laughs) Just repent of it. It's okay. You can lay it down. Listen, today I want to tell you, you don't have to be a sorry, not sorry person. That's not for you. You don't have to keep trying to win the approval of others and protect whatever you're trying to protect. You don't have to keep hiding 
why? There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. None. It's okay. You are free. <laughs> and look, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has what? It has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Church, you are free. You're free. You're free. You're free from the approval of others. You're, you're free from having to try to prove yourself. You're free from building your own kingdom. You're free, you're free, you're free, you're free. And listen, even when you fail, even when you fail, because you will, here's the good news today. Listen, you are free to just repent of it and move on. He remembers your sins no more. It's okay. Lay it before him. He's going to cleanse you of your unrighteousness. You're free to repent. Your mistakes don't have to hold you captive. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're free. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There will we receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Listen, that's freedom. And there is always more grace for you. It never runs out. It's grace upon grace, upon grace, upon grace. So just keep going to him and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Repent, and he will restore to you the joy of your salvation. So today, I want to declare freedom over your life. Whatever is restraining you from experiencing that freedom in Jesus, lay it down. Just lay it down. He's faithful and just. He's going to cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. Whatever you've replaced the joy of the Lord with, whatever holds you captive, I pray against that in your life, and I pray for freedom, freedom, freedom. Let freedom ring in this place. We are free because we are accepted and adopted as children of God. Come on, get up on your feet and let's thank him that we are free in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Come on.